Let's now turn, friends, to the portion we read. Judges chapter 2, seeking God's help. We'll take uh, verse 16 for a reference. Judges 2, verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. The term of the judges ran for 400 years between Joshua uh, and Samuel. And I would like to undertake a, a study this evening, or this is an introductory sermon to a study, which we will conduct uh, in the ensuing weeks and months. I'm not sure how long it will continue for. Um, It's an interesting book. We don't know who wrote the Judges. The common assumption is that it was written by Samuel. And he is certainly the link between the Judges and the Kings. And Many people call Samuel the last of the judges of Israel. Now, all of this took place over a thousand years, 1,200 years actually, before Christ was born. But there is an ongoing significance to many aspects of uh, the history of the judges, an ongoing significance to ourselves as part of the Christian church and to the Christian church in the entire New Testament era. In particular, how a cycle of blessing and prosperity was matched by sin, disobedience and judgment. And that cycle continues in every age amongst the sons of men. And that's also the pattern of man's relationship with God. In the New Testament, it comes out very clearly that we have times of blessing and prosperity, but that is so often spoiled by times of sin, disobedience and judgment. Now, we can see this not just in the church and the conduct of the church, but we can see it in the nation, in our own nation, we know this pattern emerged very clearly indeed. Great times of blessing and prosperity, but that was more than matched, sadly, by times of gross sin and disobedience and the inevitable judgment. So the story of the church uh, in every age is a constant drifting in and out of God's favour. Now, all the nations that have been built on the Christian ethic, what we call the Christian West or Western nations, they uh, repeated this cycle with uncanny accuracy. And a study of the judges will help us in that it's instructive, especially on the character of leadership and how the leaders in the era of the judges, how they dealt with the various situations that arose in their day and generation. Because not really much has changed since then in the fundamental issues that are at stake in human conduct, in Christian conduct, and in the conduct of nations and of the church. Not really very much has changed despite the passing of three millennia. Now, chapter one of this book refers to the final stages uh, of Joshua's leadership. That's why I I began in chapter two. The next generation after Joshua was led by Caleb. And the children of Israel, it's interesting, you know, what's the information that God has deliberately revealed to us in many aspects of the uh, conduct of his people. The children of Israel held the fort. This shows you how um, important the influence of Christian people is on subsequent generations. They held the fort whilst the godly generation of Caleb 
and those that followed him was sustained. We read in verse 7 here, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. But sadly, most of the 12 tribes failed to do what God had commanded them to do, and that was to expel the idolatrous Canaanites. Hence the rebuke you see in the end of verse 2. You have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Now to some people, of course, Judges is just another religious book. They see little significance in the uh, stories that it has recorded for us. In fact, many people object to the book of Judges because of the many instances of what is perceived as inhumane and cruel conduct, even by the people of God. But nevertheless, my friends, when you read through the book of Judges and through Joshua as well, you know, there are, there are many examples of this kind of conduct in the world today and always has been and always will be. Not really much has changed over the generations and over the millennia. But one reason why this book is important, it shows us how and how not to deal with situations when sin is running out of control. So let's explore some of the subjects here. Let's look first of all at uh, geographic Israel and God's plan for the world. Uh, we won't concern ourselves just now with modern arguments about Israel, so Palestinians, Jews and Arabs. Let's leave all that aside. We won't even concern ourselves with the role of for the Jews in the end times because they obviously have a role according to the New Testament in Romans 9 to 11. Now, whatever our view might be on the Jews in that regard, we have to accept the unparalleled role God gave the nation of Israel in the world. They have a huge significance. They had then and they still have now, and I suppose they always will. But this is important to my own understanding of the story of the Jews. This is about far more important things than geography or politics or religious traditions even. This, to, 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 when you look at Israel um, in the Bible and the complex boundaries that are set out for them in biblical times and the boundaries they have today, the story of Israel is not really about land. It's about people. It's not about the Jews as an ethnic race. It's about sinners brought into covenant with God. That's the real story of the Jews. And the true heirs of Israel aren't the Jews who are ethnic people, not Palestinians, not Arabs. These are all usurpers, imposters, and even squatters. God made it plain from the very beginning, my friends, that his interest was in people. Listen to this verse from Genesis 12, verse 7. God appeared to Abraham and said, to thy seed will I give this land. Now, that wasn't about Abraham's natural seed, but rather about Abraham's spiritual seed. Galatians 3, 16. He didn't say to seeds as of many, but as of one. To thy seed, which is Christ. So the true heirs of Israel are the men and women, young and old, in every generation, in every culture, who walk as Abraham walked, by faith with the living God. So it's the people that is in focus in this story and throughout the Bible as far as I can understand. 
So let's look at God settling his people in the promised land. Moses led these people, as we know, from Egypt uh, to the eastern shore of the Jordan. And then when Moses died, Joshua took over and led them across the river and established their headquarters first at Gilgal and then at Shiloh. Now, for the remainder of Joshua's life, he led a constant battle, fought, cleansed, and conquered numerous cities and territories. And the land was then divided, as you know, between the 12 tribes. There was nothing like this in history, and then nothing, there would be nothing like it again either. But it's important to understand what was going on here. We might misunderstand the intentions of God in all of this, as many others do in the world to this day. If we don't carefully study the narrative that we have in the book of Joshua, as well as in the book of uh, uh, Judges, it's very easy to come to all the wrong conclusions. Consider a parallel with this in the colonization program of nations like our own nation, the British Empire. We can be, I suppose, as disparaging as others are of the colonization of places like Africa and India. And many also tut, tut as you know, about the way the Aboriginal people in Australia and Indians in America were uh, chased out of their homelands. And it's all down, so the argument goes, to colonial greed. Now, many people read this and they say, that's exactly what you have in Joshua and in Judges as well. No, it's not. This is not about colonization. It's important for us to understand this is not about ethnic cleansing. This is about God taking what belongs to, <coughs> to himself. Canaanites, um, we're not very sure how many, but we know that some Canaanites were allowed to remain in the land and to live with Israelites. Rahab is a classic example of that. God had a threefold purpose in what he was doing. First of all, he was claiming what rightly belonged to himself. Psalm 24, verse 1, we'll be singing this in a concluding praise. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So God was just claiming what already belonged to him. Secondly, God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham. To thy seed I will give this land. But perhaps more importantly from our point of view, thirdly, God was cleansing the land of idols and of altars and of idolatry. Look at verse 2. You shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land, but throw down their altars. Now notice again the focus is on people. God did not want his people to be lured into the practice of gathering around altars and becoming involved in idolatry and other sinful and harmful practices. And that's when the book of Judges becomes relevant to the New Testament Christian church. This matter, my friends, is constantly on God's agenda, delivering his people from altars, from idols, and from sinful conduct. God wants us to have an environment free of these things. And God did provide us with these things. When the gospel first came to our land, our land was characterized by all these superstitious views of religious practices. But through the power of the gospel, all that was cleansed. And instead of idols and altars, the Christian church was established 
up and down the land from John O'Groats to Land's End. And nowhere was that more blessed than it was in our island communities. Now, when we um, probe this deeper than the physical aspect of idols and idolatry and sinful practices, we have to remember that these things are more than religious accoutrements. An idol is anything that comes between man and God. Anything. An altar is any platform upon which we should be offering to God when we should be offering to others what we should be offering to God. Whether that is time, money, our affections, our devotions, our interest, whatever it might be, that is your altar. And not only, like, not only so, but like the children of Israel, the idols you threw away yesterday and the altars you perhaps tore down today can be and often are replaced by us tomorrow. This is an ongoing battle for us. This is an ongoing challenge because we follow the pattern of the children of Israel with monotonous regularity. So let's consider living among the idols. It's not impossible, you know, for the people of God to live and to rub shoulders with idols. That's not impossible. Canaan was never fully cleansed of its idols. Yet we know that under Joshua, and throughout the lifetime of the next generation, the idols and the altars of the heathen, they were kept at arm's length. Verse 7, the people served the Lord all the days of the elders that had lived Joshua. And that was in the midst of all the altars and all the idols. These people knew the danger of living among the idols. So they kept them at arm's length. Now they demonstrated that it is possible for us to do the this, this same. So for over 25 years, they remained faithful to God. They didn't allow the idols of Canaan to become a snare to them. They kept away from every alluring altar. And if nothing else, my friends, it shows us that the presence of altars, idols, and idolatry are not necessarily killer blows to the Christian church and to God's people. It may make things difficult for us and challenging for us and trying for us, but it's nothing that faith and grace cannot overcome. Even the, the history of Christianity demonstrates to us that it's possible to remain undefiled living among the idols. But sadly, history also records how easily and quickly the Lord's people can succumb to the influence of idols and altars. Here you will notice it happened in one generation. Verse 10, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. So from that point on, they began to decline. They began to look to other things and eventually to other gods and other altars. And the speed and the extent of their apostasy was quite staggering. Now, what, where would you say the children of Israel failed most in all of this? What is interesting, you were singing about it a moment ago, and you were singing some of the most telling words in the entire scriptures in Psalm 106. They mingled among the heathen and learned their ways. That's where they went wrong. They mingled 
among the heathen and learned their ways. And the result of that was a tragic cycle of horrible, sinful conduct and God's fierce judgments upon them. Now, the book of Judges is a story of God's patience in sending judge after judge, time after time, always having to rescue his people. But as their sin increased, the judges became less and less effective, and God, slowly but surely, withdrew from them. The end result you will find in the last verse in the book of Judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. There's no more tragic testimony of a nation of people in the history of humanity. Every man did what was right in his own eyes, all because they mingled with the heathen and learned their works. Now, in our ultra-modern civilised society, how are we faring living among the idols? The Scotland of today, my friends, is not the society that your fathers and forefathers knew. Far from it. And in only a generation, Scotland has abandoned its gospel heritage. In only a generation. When most of us were young, we still had that heritage. And that heritage was obvious and evident to the world around us. But it's gone. My friends, it's gone. Why? Because leaders in the nation and leaders in the church began mingling with the heathen and learning their ways. And the gods of academia and science are now being worshipped more than the God of our fathers. And living among the idols, the Christian church has slowly but surely become less and less effective as a force for good in our land. The church itself has downgraded the Bible to a little more than a historical document. And to our political leaders and masters, David Attenborough makes more sense than the all-wise God. We're in a bad way, my friends. We're in a bad way. And now, far too many of our fellow citizens are like the children of Israel in Canaan. Verse 10, they knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. That's where we are at today, my friends. Most of our fellow citizens know absolutely nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ nor about the gospel, nor about the history of the church. They know absolutely nothing. And most of our contemporaries never even heard, they don't even understand the, the words religious revival. They haven't a clue what that means. Yet they all gladly bow at the altar of Mammon. They willingly serve the gods of science, and they near deify the institutions of academia. But we have something that the children of Israel didn't have. They lost Joshua. Verse 8, Joshua died being 110 years old. And all the wise generation after him, they also died. However, we have a deliverer, we have a judge, we have a saviour with whom there is no fault, no failing, and who will never again die. 
he lives forever because he rose on the third day in the power of an endless life. And he rules over his church and his people as the living Savior, the living God, the living King of kings and Lord of lords. But for us to serve him faithfully, my friends, we must continue to tear down the altars. We must continue to despise the idols of our day. And we must continue earnestly striving to keep covenant with our God. We shall continue this in a couple of weeks' time. Let's. We thank thee, gracious Lord, for thy word. We thank thee for the instruction we receive from it. We thank thee for the examples that are set out for us. And help us to be wise in reading and interpreting and discerning these matters and in applying them to ourselves and grant that we would not fall into the snares that Israel fell into so often down the ages of Old Testament history. Preserve us, O Lord, as the apple of thine eye and guide us and build us up in our most holy faith. Preserve the church and may the kingdom of God come with power, even in our own midst here in this corner of the vineyard. For Jesus' sake, amen. Stand for the benediction of friends. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.